Healthful, refreshing, delicious double mint chewing gum presents for your listening pleasure Broadway's My Beat. Broadway's My Beat, from Times Square to Columbus Circle, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway's My Beat, the thrilling drama of murder and mystery and the people who walk the great white way, with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. Chew delicious double mint gum often every day and see how much more you enjoy things. The refreshing double mint flavor makes your mouth and throat feel cool and comfortable. The smooth, easy chewing gives you a bright little lift. So at work or pleasure, indoors or out, enjoy chewing delicious double mint gum. <laughs> When shadows drift to the canyon streets and the beginning moon starts to ride, Broadway sends up its manufactured stars, giving notice that night is here. Then around every corner, the fingers beckon and gather up the crowds, so furious funnel down the avenue. Each in his own way, make time stand still. That's the trick. Or make it dance, or softly sigh, or hug you close. Pick your dream. It's anything you want on Broadway. And east on 47th Gray Granite area, sometimes devoted to Gray Granite Enterprise, as, for example, Los Amigos Athletic Club, where I was, second floor. Locker room off the swimming pool, and the towel swathed and very concerned man. Is he hurt bad? I don't know, Mr. Anderson. They got him across the hall in one of the tables, and there's a doctor there with him. What made him well, do That's it? not the question right now. The question is, why did you slug him and then run all around the building like you were... I, I got hysterical. I thought when I pushed him and he slipped and fell down and he didn't move, I'd killed him. So I ran around and told everybody, called for help, and got first aid. I, I guess I'm not very good in a pinch. Now, why did you slug him? Pushed him. Oh? Let's just get that straight, that's all. Okay, just tell me what happened. Well, we, we just finished doing our ten lengths together up and down the pool, took our shower, and came right in here. We'd open our lockers. Danny? And... Oh, hi, Muggerman. This is Jesse Anderson, Detective Muggerman. Hi, Mr. Hi. Anderson. Mr. Anderson is the man who... Pushed uh, did... Marty Lane, not hit him, pushed him. Well, whatever you did to him, he's lying on a rubbing table unconscious, Mr. Anderson. The doc is shaking his head sadly. Did I kill him? Uh-uh. No. But the doc says probably he's got a fractured skull. How bad he can't tell until he's taken to a hospital next raid. Listen, I like Marty Lane. Is this I... where he lives? This address in his wallet? Let me see. Yeah, that's right. Listen, I'm trying to tell you whatever happens to him, it's not my fault. I want to make a positive statement to that effect, and I want you to... You opened your and... lockers, and then what happened? Huh? Oh, I-, I remembered I left my towel in the shower room, so I went back there to look for it. And what? I came back here, and Marty was going through my pockets. Doing what? Stealing? Well, what do you go through someone's pockets for? To leave surprises? Right now, with your friend in there maybe dying, we can do without the lip. Was he stealing? Uh, I don't know. What does that mean? He looked like he was searching for something, like he knew what he was looking for. Did you find it? I don't think so. He saw me and asked what the heck I was doing spying on him. I said, now look here. And he came over and swung on me. I'm a fairly agile man. Maybe I don't look it, but you I... You ducked. Yeah, yeah, I did. Then you pushed him. Defending myself... Look, it's a slippery floor. And all you did was push him. Look, I like the guy. Twice a week after work, we play handball and go our ten lengths. You think I try to kill him? Now, do I look like that kind of a boy? See that he gets dressed, Muggerman, and take him downtown. Leave there and out into the night street. Street that holds a dimly heard echo of Broadway three blocks away. Car ride now, downtown. Mission to break the news to an injured man's wife. West 28th, the injured man's address found in his wallet. 1212, brownstone converted into apartments. And the directory reads, Mr. and Mrs. Martin Lane, 2C, on a handing card. Up the self-service elevator and down a corridor of red and luminescent carpet and green wallpaper. Jungle foliage type decor. Apartment 2C is halfway down. Mrs. Lane? She's home. Just give a little time. Uh, oh, okay. This time, every Wednesday. Oh, go ahead. Knock again. You you were saying about this time every Wednesday... I'm a baker. Then bread smells good. Well, here, go ahead. Take a whiff. Uh, 
Uh, about this time every Wednesday. I deliver uh, bread. Uh, Mrs. Lane is a girl who likes for dinner a fresh loaf of bread from the oven. She, uh, mind if I do? No, go ahead. Mrs. Lane, it's me, Charlie. Charlie the baker, Mrs. Something's wrong. Oh? Something's wrong. For three years, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, I bring freshly baked bread. Mrs. Lane, it's me, Charlie. Something's wrong. We better get the man. She has a miss for three years, and at five o'clock she called me and told me tonight the kind of bread she wanted. Let's try the door. Something's wrong. It's me, Mrs. Lane. It's Charlie the baker. I told you. I told you. I told you. What'd she do? Faint or something? Dead. She's been strangled. A silence then in the room. And below, in the street, the drift of summer voices. The droning city heard clearly now. A puff of wind that moved the lace curtain moved a strand of hair across the woman's face. I phoned in the death. The next morning, positive identification was made from fingerprints checked out against a driver's license found in the woman's belongings. She was Mrs. Marty Lane, wife of Marty Lane, who was in the Polytechnic Hospital from a head injury. I called the hospital and was told Mr. Lane was improved, but still incoherent, still dazed with shock, and told that the staff had read or heard of his wife's murder and would keep the knowledge from him pending further instructions from me. Legwork, then, at the Lane apartment house. A neighbor of theirs in the apartment across the hall... You're perfectly welcome to come in if you want, Mr. Clover. There's no need for you to stand out here, hat in hand. Thank you. Well, I missed all the excitement last night. Oh? My husband and I were at the park, and... uh, Why don't you sit over there, Mr. Clover? It's cooler there. Uh, Yes, thank you. Yes, like I said, I missed all the excitement. There, Harry and I were in the park. Harry's my husband. Just lying there on the grass, watching the other people, and all the while, Katie was right here, right in this apartment building, getting herself killed... I go on and on like a talking machine, don't I? Oh, it's all right, Mrs. Brewster. People... No. Uh, Other people react differently. Like to Katie's death, I mean. I've seen how they reacted right in this building. They're very quiet or scared or very cynical. Harry's a little like that. Me, I just babble on and on and on because, well... well why, uh, Mrs. Brewster? I like Katie. I liked her very much. And you were good friends. I suppose you could call us that. We liked each other. You had mutual interests? Mutual interests, yes. As all women have. We talked about our husbands, their faults, and what was especially nice about them, and the times they were especially nice, and we'd set each other's hair if one or the other of us was going out on a party Did Mrs. Lane get along all right with her husband? What? I said, did... Yes, I know what you said. It's just struck me so odd a question like that has to be asked that... Did they get along all right? They adored each other. I know they did. I often watched them when we were together, all of us. Sort of eavesdrop watching. They did little things, and I know they adored each other. And she made no great effort, just the way she was. They... I uh, don't understand. Well, I mean, she never wore fancy slick clothes or makeup or anything like that. She dressed simply. Her face was her own. They loved each other, except... Except what? Oh, don't prick up your ears like that. It wasn't anything. What was it? Oh, just that Katie told me once her husband was a stick in the mud. Not a lot of fun. And I said to her, are you kidding? I've watched you two, I said. And she started to laugh, too, and said, no, he was an angel. Just... I feel ashamed. I don't know why I've talked so much about that. Katie dead. Katie murdered, and I... Please, if you don't mind... She moved to a chair and sat down in sudden weariness. When I thanked her, her hands hid her face from me. I left. Check out now the other neighbors in the apartment house. Reaction to the death of Mrs. Lane about the way Mrs. Brewster had said. Quiet, frightened, cynical. Which meant who cares, I was told by a cynical young woman. But a consensus to be drawn. Mr. and Mrs. Lane were fine people. Quiet, very nice, very friendly, didn't offend, didn't bother anyone. Fine and good persons, admirable human beings. Consensus with which Sergeant Gino Tataglia differed. That Marty Lane, Danny, he's got a record that goes back six years. A record as long as my arm. What are you talking about? Record, Danny. Record is dug out by Detective Mugovan. Lane's name on the blotter and so what forth. What kind of record? Well, no felonies, Danny, nothing like that. Just minor misdemeanors, huh. brushes with the law. No respect to an officer, drunk driving, disturbing the peace, bar brawls, like that, with as long as my arm. 
Now his missus... What about her? Also on the book, by her maiden name. But just once, Danny, June 1950, for hefting a stein of beer through the plate glass of a bar window and handed another stein by a fellow named of Howard Graham, which she threw at the bar what mirror. What are you talking about? Mugovan checked him out, Danny, and brought him in. Said you should talk to him. Very interesting conversationalist. Who, Howard Graham? Who's been waiting outside for you for an hour. Bring him in. Mr. Graham, this way to see Danny Clover. Thank you, Gino. You can go. Have a chair, Mr. Graham. Yeah, thanks. <sighs> Seems that uh, you knew Mrs. Katie Lane. Especially when she wasn't a missus. Especially when she was just Katie Heglin. You got arrested once. Yeah, we got arrested, me and Katie. But for the one time you arrested her, you must have missed it a thousand. Well, what are you talking about? That's what just what Detective Muggerman asked me. Did you tell him? Mm-hmm. Well, tell me, too. Well, Katie was wild. What I mean is she was wild. There was a time once in Harlem, in the village once. She pulled the same thing, the very same thing, and nobody arrested her. Detective Muggerman told you she was dead? He didn't have to. I read it. And I remembered Katie like she used to be with me. I told the detective Did about... you know her husband? Yeah, I knew him. Marty was more Katie's style than me. I couldn't keep up. So he took her away from me, married her. You ever see him afterwards? They invited me up a few times after. I got so I didn't go anymore, though. Why not? Oh, I don't know. They were changed. Not the same people. Couldn't have fun like the old times. What do you mean? Just that, no fun. They'd done something to each other. Katie was like another woman, Marty like another man. Why, I still they don't... They were very good people, angels. They had very good thoughts, Katie especially. One thing I know. What? Like I said, she changed. She thought good thoughts, though, so she's practically a cinch to make, haven't I? Yeah, sure. Sure she is. Katie's a cinch. Whatever kind of work you do, I'm sure you've noticed how it's the long, dull jobs that sort of get you down. You get so bored with doing the same thing over and over. Well, next time that happens, find out what a lot of help it is to chew delicious double mint gum. You see, as soon as you sink your teeth into a stick of smooth double mint, you enjoy a feeling of real satisfaction. And you'll like the steady, natural rhythm of chewing. Delicious double mint is a long-lasting treat, too. You can chew away for as long as you like, and you have something you enjoy doing while you go on with your work. And that cool, clean, double mint flavor is so refreshing, it gives you a pleasant lift. So you feel better, and things seem to go faster and easier. Yes, delicious double mint gum is a pleasant chewing treat that's helpful as well as enjoyable. So buy several packages at a time and treat yourself to a stick at work or anywhere. That's double mint chewing gum. Healthful. Refreshing. Delicious. We now continue with Broadway's My Beat, written by Morton Fine and David Friedkin, and starring Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. Late July, and the sun bursts over Broadway. And the light is golden and blinding, and the heat white, searing. And still they walk it. Walk the avenues of the sun, the tourists, the gawkers, the conquerors, the sleepwalkers. For the hawkers of Broadway have summer gimmicks to sell, not to be had elsewhere. And the tipsters of Broadway, a winner to be whispered such as was never known. And the sentimentalists of Broadway, a poem never before heard, crooned softly into the ear. So think fast, make a choice, summer is short. And at headquarters, early morning of July, the talk, heat-weary, against background of drone is spun by the electric fan. They'll bring Anderson right up, Danny. Drone is spun by Detective Muggerman. You got a thought on it, Danny? Well, Dr. Sinsky's report says Mrs. Lane was strangled at approximately 5 in the evening, just after she called the baker. Uh-huh. Uh, when do we get to talk to her husband, Danny? Oh, I checked the hospital a little while ago. He's still in no shape. Be helpful if we could talk to him. Uh-huh. Yes, Gino. Mr. Anderson, Danny. Officer Curcio just brought him up. Okay, bring him in. 
Sit down, Mr. Anderson. Look, how long are you people Till we hold... find out what happens to Mr. Lane from the push you gave him. You said it was a push. A couple other things. How is he? How's Marty? Not good, Mr. Anderson. We just got through asking a little while ago. Marty's not good. Uh, go on, sit down. You and your friend Marty come to the athletic club twice a week, that right? That's right, twice a week. How did Marty get there? What? How did Marty get there? Why, his wife drove him there. You sure? Of course I'm sure. Why should I lie about a thing like that? Nobody says you're lying. Just tell us how you know Mr. Lane's wife drove him to the gym club twice a week. I know, because I see her. I see her drive up. Oh. Yeah, I see her. I always get to the club earlier than Marty. I wait for him in the reading room. Take my chair near the window, watch for him, wait for him, have a drink, read. Watch the passers-by. Watch for Marty, wait for him. Katie brings him twice a week. Another question, Mr. Anderson. You said you caught Marty going through your things. What, what was he looking for? I told you, I don't know. You're trying to get me mixed up? What are you... Come people? on, Mr. Anderson. I'll give you back to Officer Crisio. Which Muggerman did. And then a little before noon, there was a phone call. The thing, Danny, the Lane automobile. It's not in their apartment garage. Nobody knows where it is. The car license number was obtained from the traffic bureau, relayed to the squad cars and the men on the beats. The Lane automobile was located in a parking lot near the Los Amigos Athletic Club, towed into the police garage. A short while later... Just came here from the lab, Danny. Here, take a look. Oh, thanks. No prints found on the steering wheel of the Lane automobile. Other prints on door and glass, too smudged. Well, maybe Mrs. Lane wore gloves, Danny. In this weather? Well, some women do. Some women wear gloves in summer because it's a fashion. A lady drives a car, I she's got I talked to a... neighbors of hers. I didn't get the impression Mrs. Lane was a fashionable woman. Mm. The other possibility is the wheel was wiped uh -huh. clean so as to get rid... Let's talk to Anderson again. Yeah, yeah, let's. I'll get him. <laughs> Right in here, Mr. Anderson. Yeah, I'm beginning to know your little place like a book. Good. You get comfy. <laughs> Chair okay? Fine, fine. Good. How's Marty? I called the hospital a few minutes ago. He's getting along. Is he going to die? No. It's a relief, boys. We want to run it down once more with you. I I'll say anything you want. Boys, I'm relieved Marty's not going to die. The whole thing in that locker was an accident, right? Right. You caught him going through your pockets, a few words, he swung, and then what? He missed. I pushed him away. He slipped in a wet spot and went out like a light. Well, it makes no sense at all that he was going through your pockets. No sense at all. Okay, let's try it this way. The stuff in this envelope is what we took from you when we brought you downtown, okay? Come on over here and look at it. Okay. Right. The wallet. Is he going after that? I, I doubt it. I saw him put it back before he caught me looking at him. Any money missing from it? Oh. There's a five-dollar bill and two ones. That's what I had when I left the house. This uh, automatic pencil? Why should he steal a dollar pencil? Well, these keys? This one's from my car. This is my house key. What do you want them for? Handkerchief? Uh-huh. This cigarette case? No. I, go back. Huh? To the handkerchief. Let me see it a minute. Okay. Ah, see? The lipstick smudge. Yeah, I see. He walked into the club. He had lipstick on his cheek, so I took it out of my breast pocket and had it to you him. You sure it was his wife? Huh? You sure it was Mrs. Lane you saw? Of course I'm sure. You see her face? Sure, I... All I saw was Marty leaned over to her and she kissed him. She always does that with Marty. She drives him. She kisses him good... Uh-huh. Hey, you said someone told you his wife didn't wear lipstick, huh, Danny? Mm-hmm. She didn't. Katie Lane never wore any makeup at all. I've known her for... You never saw her with lipstick? Nothing, and... never. Then he remembered and he wanted back that handkerchief from the woman who kissed him goodbye wasn't his wife. Hey, what's going on? Nothing you have to worry about, uh, Danny. Yeah, release him. <laughs> Which is about the time the hand moving on the wall says 3.30. Call the hospital again and be told that Martin Lane has rallied strongly and is taking nourishment. In fact, has smiled feebly at a doctor's joke. He's not strong enough, however, to be told of his wife's death. And outside, the newspapers have it. Mystery girl sought in slaying. Headline calculated to produce small chill during hot doldrum hours. 
And time and effort takes care of details, and it becomes five o'clock. Time to go talk to Martin Lane. Danny. He stopped at your office door. Wherever you're going, Danny, won't back up. This lady just came in, wants to talk to you. Hello. Hello. I'm Libby Norman. I want to see about the thing that's been in the newspaper about the death of Mrs. Lane. Well, please come in. Sit down, please. Thank you. About the death of Mrs. Lane. That's right. I believe I'm the mystery girl in the case. You drove Martin Lane to the gym yesterday and kissed him goodbye? Yes, sir, I did. Why? Martin asked me to. Tell me about it. Well, Martin asked me to. I've been in the habit of doing what he says. For how long? Six months or so. How did you meet him? Same table in a crowded cafeteria for lunch. We went for it at the same time. Instead of snarling at each other, we found ourselves smiling. I suppose a reaction like that was kind of new for both of us. And then you started seeing each other. Yes, we did, you see. Both of us, well, try to understand what I'm going to tell of you. Of course I will. We neither of us had laughed for so long. I don't seem to get along with people, and before I met Martin, I only laughed maliciously. With Martin... Different. Different. We're secret sharers of each other, Mr. Clover. You knew he was married. There's so many things I know that have stood in the way of my happiness. When he told me he was married, and he told me the very first day, it was suddenly a knowledge that didn't make any difference. Yesterday, he asked you to drive him to the club. Yes, sir, he did. And to park the car in the lot. Where he parks it when he comes to visit me. What about the fingerprints? Oh, yeah. We know the steering wheel was wiped clean. Yeah, yeah, he told me to do that. Did you know why? It was enough that he wanted it. Why did you come to me? Why are you giving yourself up? Is that what I'm doing? Giving myself up? Well, uh, well... Yeah? Martin and I were... Uh, I don't know, some plan. Like what? He said he had something figured out. It was enough, but now I... Yeah? It'll be a long time. Yes. <laughs> Mr. Lane, this is Detective Mugovan. Hi. How do you feel? Mm. How do you feel? Mm. <laughs> I guess the doc was a liar, huh, Danny? I guess so. Mr. Lane, the doctor just told us you swapped him a joke for the one he told you before. He says you can put on a great accent. He said he didn't particularly like the joke, but the accent was great. Tell us the joke. Uh, mm hmm. I'm sleepy. Groggy, huh? Mm. Yeah. A terrible fall you had. Hurts. Hurts. Libby Norman dropped into huh? headquarters. Libby Norman dropped in headquarters. Why? She said you'd had some plans. Why did she drop in? To give herself up. To give herself up, Mr. Lane. Shall I yell for an intern? Okay, oh, okay. What's this all about? I'm going to run it down for you. Your wife was found strangled to death yesterday. Was this the place you were supposed to shout and holler and say that she just drove me to the athletic club? She just kissed me goodbye. Who could have killed her? Why? What's the matter? Feeling awful? Libby showed up, huh? Told us about driving you to the club, kissing you so that Jesse Anderson would think she was your wife. Laid it out how she was your alibi. She didn't say that. She didn't say alibi. No, she didn't. She didn't know what it was all about. Get off it, Mr. Lane. I swear she didn't. She did just what I told her. Listen, yeah. if I hadn't have fallen in the locker room, you would have been nowhere. You would never have found Libby. You would never have known about her. You found out about, about the, the handkerchief. Hand. Lipstick on it. Your wife didn't wear makeup, so it wasn't your wife drove you to the club. Another woman. Look for her, find her. Also find motive. Okay, okay. Got tired, huh, Mr. Lane? Okay, okay. A good and quiet life got too tiresome. You needed a change. I said okay, didn't I? Hey, you were quite a boy before you got married. Isn't that what you heard, Danny? He got into scrapes. Yeah, and his wife got into scrapes, too. Mm. You should have seen my wife before we were married. Gay, beautiful, wonderful dresser, and always having a ball. Wonderful girl. 
I changed for her so she'd have me. She changed for you. She became a drab. She thought that's what I wanted, and I did. I thought I did. That's what I became, too, a drab. You met Libby Norman. She wasn't gay, she wasn't a party girl, but she wasn't drab, and we had fun. Adult fun, not the kind of kid stuff Katie and I used to have. What made you strangle your wife? I don't know. I got angry, I got fed up. At her? At her, at me. In the years of nothing we had, I, I got fed up. I strangled her. Evening lowers down over Broadway. The time is ending. The daylight crowds find the subway and go back uptown. A small interval now of twilight hush, which ends quickly, which gives entrance to the nighttime people. And the street explodes. It's Broadway, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway. My beat. Refreshing double mint chewing gum is really two treats in one. A satisfying, long-lasting chewing treat and a delicious flavor treat. That's a pleasant combination for real enjoyment and for a good many welcome helps that mean a lot when you need them. For example, when you get hungry in between meals, chew a stick of double mint and you'll find it's easier to wait until mealtime. You see, the smooth chewing is satisfying and gives you something pleasant to do. And double mint is light and agreeable, never rich or heavy. The cool, clean double mint flavor freshens your taste and sweetens your breath, too. Yes, delicious double mint gum gives you a good deal of enjoyment and many pleasant helps, all at a mighty low cost. So try it soon, at work or pleasure, indoors or out. Enjoy delicious double mint chewing gum. Costs so little, tastes so good, lasts so long. <laughs> The makers of Double Mint Chewing Gum hope you enjoyed tonight's story and that you are enjoying delicious Double Mint Gum every day. We invite you to join us again next week at this same time when Detective Danny Clover returns again with Broadway's My Beat. Broadway's My Beat, brought to you by Double Mint Chewing Gum, is produced and directed by Elliot Lewis, with music composed and conducted by Alexander Courage. The program is written by Morton Fine and David Friedkin, and stars Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover, with Charles Calvert as Tartaglia and Jack Crucian as Mogafin. In tonight's story, Barney Phillips was heard as Marty and Lou Merrill as Jesse. Featured in the cast were Irene Tedrow, Kathy Lewis, and Ted DeCorsia. Bill Anders speaking. This is the CBS Radio Network.